Good morning, good afternoon or good evening depending on where you are in the world and welcome to today's webcast. Status of solar heating and cooling worldwide is brought to you by solarthermalworld.org. This webinar is jointly organized by REN21 Secretariat and the International Agency Solar Heating and Cooling Technology Program. I am Nigel Cotton, founder of solarthermalworld.org and program director at the European Copper Institute. I am your moderator for today. Before we begin, I'll just give you a few uh, housekeeping announcements. This webinar is designed to be interactive between you and the presenters. Slides will be available within 48 hours of uh, the end of the webinar on solarthermalworld.org. This presentation is being recorded. You can participate in the questions and answer session at the end of the presentation by asking questions at any time during the presentation. Just type your question into the Q&A widget to the left of the slide window and then click. <coughs> you may address the area of any widget, such as the slide area, by dragging the lower right hand corner of the widget window and dragging the mouse. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. The webinar will last about 1 hour 30 minutes, 20 minutes for each presentation and approximately 20 minutes of Q&A after the presentations. If you are experiencing problems with the program, please refresh your browser or close your window and relaunch the presentation. Okay. Now on to today's presentations. Um, discussing today's topic will be Rana Abib, the research coordinator at REN21 Secretariat, and she will be highlighting the status of renewable energies based on REN21's Renewables 2016 Global Status Report. Following her will be Werner Weiss, he's director of the Euro Austrian Institute AEE, INTECT, and co-author of the study Solar Heat Worldwide from the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program. Werner will share key data on solar heating and cooling from the study on added capacity, prospering application jobs and costs. Third speaker will be Barbel Epp, news editor of the solarthermalworld.org, and author of the Global Status Report section, Solar Heating and Cooling Market and Industry Tens, will present recent developments in the industry and policy. My name is Nigel Cotton. I'm a founding member of ISTIF, the European Solar Thermal Industry Federation, uh, advisor to the United Nations, and founder of solarthermalworld.org. Okay, now we will move on to the presentations. The first one. Is from Rana. So, Rana, your slides are now up. Okay, you may begin, Rana. Okay, thank you very much, Nigel, and thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to do the webinar on, in collaboration with you. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak about a topic which is not always so visible, uh, but very important when we are talking about uh, the energy transition. And I'm really excited also to um, host this webinar together with AA Intech, um, the IA Solar Heating and Cooling Program, and Solrico, um, as well as uh, Solar Thermal World. Um, so I will present to you uh, some key results of the Renewables 2016 Global Status Report, which uh, REN21, which is the Renewable Energy Pulse Network for the 21st century, is producing every year. Oops, sorry. I... Hello. Nigel, could you eventually uh, show the slides? Can you hear me? Yeah. Is that visible okay. now? Yes, it's visible. Thank you. Sorry for that. 
Um, so what is Rent in One? We are a global multi-stakeholder network which is dedicated to the rapid uptake of renewable energy worldwide and we're representing basically it's a network of different types of organizations. Um, there are NGOs, science and academia, international organizations, national governments and industry associations. It's uh, basically the coalition of the willing um, to reach the energy transition building on renewable energy. Um, the objective is really to foster renewable energy deployment, focusing in particular also on um, the policy and regulatory angle of it. Um, oh, sorry, I did an error again. <laughs> sorry for that, Nigel. <laughs> Okay. okay, sorry for this. Um, so every year, or I'm mentioning the fact that it's a multi-stakeholder network because this is something which is really fundamental also to our approaches when we're producing the Renewables Global Status Report. It is a report which is produced uh, as a collaborative effort of a network of uh, 700 um, experts worldwide, of which uh, something like uh, 350 are really actively participating. And uh, this report is... Um, basically aiming to illustrate in a very neutral uh, way the status of renewable energy. There is a focus on the global overview, which is looking in particular at the power sector, heating and cooling and transport, market and industry trends where we're looking into the different renewable energy technologies, distributed renewable energy for energy access. Um, the investment flow, this is in collaboration with uh, UNEP and Bloomberg New Energy Finance. The policy landscape, since um, two years actually, we have a full section of energy efficiency just because the energy transition is not possible if we do not also look into energy demand. And this is certainly a topic which also needs to be, I mean, the awareness needs to be raised that it means more integrated approaches also looking at renewables and energy efficiency. And we have a feature every year which is changing. In this edition, we have a feature specifically on community renewable energy. So the report covers uh, all renewable energy technologies, um, power, heating and cooling and transport sector. Um, data collected throughout the process are available on the Renewables Interactive Map. Um, here you see the community and I'm mentioning this because we also see that basically the data for the heating uh, and cooling um, sector is often more dispersed, so we're really looking uh, or trying to mobilize also players who think that they might have a piece of the puzzle, basically, uh, to contribute here. Uh, our objective is clearly to strengthen the section uh, on heating and cooling and on transport, just because we see that there is a big focus on power from policymakers, from industry, but uh, we need to address these sectors more, and that's also why we're really happy to have this webinar. Um, so if you have the impression that you could be interested or could contribute, please don't hesitate to contact me. So um, what is the status in 2016? It has been an extraordinary year for renewable energy with 147 gigawatt of renewable power capacity added in 2015, um, which is the largest annual increase ever. So this is really significant. Um, it's also important to mention that um, the installed capacities in new power or the um, new added capacities in the power sector um, exceed for the second time um, the uh, installed capacities in fossil fuel based um, power generation capacity. So here we clearly see that there is a big trend towards renewable energy power and this is driven very much by the wind and the PV sector and obviously also by low costs um, or decreased costs in these sectors. Um, in renewable heat in the renewable heat sector, there is also a positive trend with an increased um, capacity of 38 gigawatt thermal. However, um, the developments are at a slower, slower pace. Um, total biofuels production also rose. So when we see that these positive trends occur, it's important to keep in mind that in 2016, basically, the fossil fuel prices were really low, which means that, um, which even 
um, make the renewables shine more, I guess, uh, because they have been so successful. Um, we have some renewable energy indicators, but there are obviously also some champions. When we are looking into uh, the investment in renewable power and fuels, not including large hydro, the front runners are China, the US, Japan, United Kingdom, and India. The picture is very different when we bring this down to um, a unit of GDP, with Mauritania, Honduras, Uruguay, Morocco, and Jamaica being front runners. And this is something which is really interesting because we see a shift from traditional historic markets to developing countries. And we also see that there is a clear engagement of developing countries to um, deploy renewable energy. Um, interestingly, when we're looking into the renewable power capacity per capita um, among the 20 top 20 countries, we have Denmark, Germany, Sweden, Spain, and Portugal. And I'm raising this because this really shows the importance of policy engagement. These are countries which engaged into the renewable energy route since a long time, have set up these uh, the right to policy and regulated frameworks, and uh, this is really reflected by the fact that they are leading. When we are looking into the heat sector, solar water heating collector capacity, China, the US, Germany, Turkey, and Brazil are fourth runner. Per capita, it's again Austria, Cyprus, Israel, Barbados, and Greece. Um, I mentioned the crucial role of policy. So um, today, almost all countries have either renewable energy targets or, and or renewable energy support policies. Um, what we clearly see, and you have basically the, you have the, the bluish, um, the bluish uh, bars are the power policies, um, the orange ones is heating and cooling, and uh, the green ones is transport. So we clearly see that there is a focus of policy makers on the power sector. And um, what we also see in the power sector is that with the evolve or the development of the markets, um, we also see a shift of type of policies. Historically, we had lots of feed-in tariffs, and now we see that uh, uh, countries with the maturity of the markets, costs going down, are going uh, more and more into uh, tendering auction systems. Um, so you can see it, we have 114 countries with power policies, 66 countries with transport, and only 21 countries with heating and cooling policies. Here, when we're talking about heating and cooling, we're looking at the technology neutral obligations and solar obligations. Um, so there is a lot of space for improvement. That's clearly uh, a lesson of 2016. Coming to the power sector, uh, renewables accounted for 28.9% of global power generation capacity and 237 of uh, the global electricity demand. They made up 60% um, of net additions, sorry, something moved here, um, to global power capacity, and the total uh, renewable energy power capacity was 1,849 gigawatt, which is an increase of over 9%, or sorry, increase of uh, almost 9% compared to 2014. We clearly see that hydropower plays a big role, but the other leaders are wind, biopower, solar PV. Um, when we are looking um, at the heating and cooling sector, and just the fact that I'm not able to show you, uh, show you, I'd say, a similar slide uh, in the heating and cooling sector as we have in the power sector here, shows already that we have another challenge in the heating and cooling sector. It's much more dispersed information, and it's uh, more challenging to really assess um, the installed capacities as well as um, the heat and uh, the, the production, the energy production in these sectors. Um, however, there is uh, energy use uh, for heat accounts for about half of the total world's final energy consumption, as you probably all know, and the renewable energy fair share represents uh, around 8%. Um, when you see basically the slide here, you, I, I mentioned the 20 countries or 21 countries uh, with heating and cooling policies. We really see that uh, many countries could and should engage in uh, setting up these frameworks. 
In the transport sector, the situation is a little more positive when we look at the policy sector, um, policy frameworks. However, renewable energy accounted for an estimated 4% of global energy demand for road transport in 2013, which is up from 2% in 2007, but again, space for improvement too. What we clearly also see is the development, the very dynamic developments in the power sector have an influence on developments in the heating and cooling and the transport sector. We see that there is cost pressure on uh, heating and cooling technologies, that there is, an, uh, to a certain extent, an electrification trend which is taking place. Um, and uh, it is certainly important that the solar thermal sector, for instance, also really underlined the importance for also having um, thermal solutions uh, in these sectors um, because, yeah, it's really a key to reach 100% renewable energy. Um, I will very quickly, without going too much into detail, go through some uh, developments in the different technologies. I will not uh, cover all of these. Uh, please visit our website, um, the Global Sets Report website, to see more. So, solar PV is clearly a leader in the renewable energy technologies uh, in 2015, with capacity added of uh, 50 gigawatt, reaching a 220 gigawatt of um, installed capacities. Um, what is really important, and you see it at the curve, basically, the, it's, it's very dynamic, and the annual PV market in 2015 was nearly 10 times the world cumulated solar um, PV capacity of uh, a decade earlier. So, um, this is really very significant. In the wind power sector, um, 63 gigawatts uh, of capacity has been added, reaching 433 gigawatts. In uh, some countries, we also see um, that there is a trend in the offshore wind uh, with an estimated 3.4 gigawatt of grid connected um, or of off grid wind added in 2015. Um, what is interesting here is, I mean, there is always this discussion of uh, integration of variable renewable um, renewables into the grids, and there are just countries like uh, Denmark and Germany, Portugal, uh, Uruguay, reaching really high shares of uh, wind power in their grid, up to 70 percent. And this is just, uh, yeah, success stories which also need to be out there. Um, it is possible to have such energy transition. Um, looking at concentrating solar thermal power, um, there was a total capacity of 4.8 gigawatt in 2015, uh, with 0.4 gigawatt added, which is an increase of 10%. Uh, what we see here, however, and this is to a certain extent also linked to um, the developments in PV and wind, is um, that the um, the rate, the increase, is uh, going down somewhat compared to a couple of years earlier. And um, the other aspect we see is that markets continue to shift to developing countries too. So. Um, I will not go into solar thermal heating and cooling because uh, you will have a great presentation of uh, Werner and uh, Bärbel, uh, with whom we're also collaborating basically um, on the solar thermal section. So Bärbel is uh, Bärbel App is uh, the author of that section, and um, I in tech under the IA solar heating and cooling program is providing a lot of data because they really have the um, uh, continuous historic data on installed capacities, etc., in their report. So we're collaborating here. Um, however, just to tell you, solar thermal heating and cooling has a space in the Global Status Report, and our message clearly is also not to only look at the power sector, but also in these sectors. Um, all these developments obviously also are reflected in the development of global investment in renewable energy, which was of 286 billion U.S. dollar in 2015, which is a new record high. It's an increase of 5 percent compared to 2014, and um, when we include um, hydropower, then large hydropower, it's, it even reaches 328.9 billion U.S. dollars. 
What is interesting, and you'll have it uh, when you look at the yellow bar, this is developed countries. Um, the grayish bars are China, India, and Brazil, and the other developing countries split up here. And for the first time, investment in renewable energy in developing countries um, exceeded investment in developed countries. And um, this is, I mean, this is a big, big message. There are markets out there. There is an interest. Cost, uh, today, it's an economic solution. And uh, renewable energy also play a very important role when we are talking about meeting the universal energy access, so the um, sustainable development goals um, on uh, energy access. When we're looking, um, yeah, sorry, just uh, to be more precise, in developing an emerging country, the increase was of 19% compared to 2014, and in developed countries, uh, there was a decrease of 8%, so another aspect underlining this shift. When we are looking now into the different renewable energy sectors, we see that solar power was going up significantly, plus 12%. Um, this is the change relative to 2014. Wind was plus 4%. All the other renewable energy technologies went down. Um, so solar power received um, received was a leader in receiving 56% um, actually of total new investment in renewables. Especially when we're also talking to to policymakers, jobs in renewable energy is obviously another argument to also go in these sectors, uh, and we're interested in this. The global employment in renewables increased by 5% in 2015 and reached an estimated 8.1 8 million um, direct and indirect jobs in the renewable energy industry. The leading employers were China, Brazil, the US, and India. Um, and when it comes to technologies, we see the solar energy sector, but also the bio energy sector as leaders. We have this feature on community renewable energy, and you see that uh, we, so first community renewable energy is really a big, big trend uh, over the, during the last uh, years. We see that um, the initiatives are, are increasing a lot, um, in particular in Europe, but it's also a trend which takes place in other regions. I mean, there is a lot of community energy ongoing in Africa, in Asia, in the US, um, and Latin America. So in Europe, there is more than and 2,800 energy cooperatives in Germany, uh, 772, and I think if I recall correctly, it's up from 200 five years ago, the Netherlands 500, and this is also something which is pushed a lot by the 100% uh, renewable energy movement, but also the energy autonomy discussion, where you can also find uh, the whole discussion of having uh, energy storage in the houses, etc. What is interesting is very often we talk about power here, but we see that there is lots of things ongoing on uh, district heating too, and uh, good examples, for instance, uh, coming from Denmark um, on having community renewable heat. So. Um, very quickly mentioning, I, I, I said that we have a section on energy efficiency. Um, we see here when we're looking at the policy map that there is an increased emphasis uh, on activities to improve energy efficiency in all sectors, and there is also a policy support. There are 146 countries with policies and 120 countries with targets. So I invite you to go to the section to read more about it. Um, Clearly, energy efficiency needs to be built into a more integrated approach. So all these developments led to a share of renewable energy in the global final energy consumption of 19.2%. And this is 2014 data, and what we also see is that the share of modern renewable increased to 10.3%. So this is really relevant for the use of traditional biomass in developing countries mainly. So I'm coming to my closing slides. <laughs> so what are the conclusions? Renewable energy, the largest global capacity additions come from re renewables to date. This is really a great message. It's a great message, but there is 
more is possible, I'd say. Um, for the second year in the row, and this is obviously very important, global carbon emissions associated with energy consumption remain stable while the global and economy grew. So we really have a decoupling uh, of growth and uh, carbon emissions, which uh, is linked to renewable energy and energy efficiency deployment. The, a big message is the majority of uh, the fossil fuel reserve need to be kept in the ground in order to reach the two degree Celsius climate target. And this is really important. It's in particular important when we think about the fact that for every dollar of subsidies to renewables, four dollars are spent. So it's, it's really a considerable um, method. Um, and very clearly, more emphasis needs to be uh, to take place on renewable energy and heating and cooling, as well as transport sectors, and also on sector coupling. We really see the need for an integrated approach at the local level, at the national level, at the regional level. Um, we need to build smarter and more flexible systems to also accommodate both centralized as well as decentralized generation. This is really true for countries which already have um, grid can, uh, very good uh, grid infrastructures, for instance. Um, in the developing countries, we really have a great opportunity to develop infrastructures which already accommodate for um, integrating renewable energies. And uh, so, here is, uh, we have some other activities, you can go on our website, and if you would like to be involved in the Global Status Report 2017, just click on that link and be in touch with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rana. So I notice we have a couple of questions that we can probably just take uh, now. One is from Jonathan Kay saying, why is your opinion, in your opinion, are governments focusing on electrical power so heavily when 70-80% of all energy needs are HVAC, which can be replaced by thermal, question mark? So I don't know if you have a comment on... I, I, to, to be honest, I think there are, there are different, um, different reasons for it. One is certainly that um, the power, or lots of the power... Um, sectors, I guess, renewable power sectors, are more centralized and more streamlined technologies too. When we're looking at the heating and cooling sector, when we're talking about bioenergy, solar thermal, etc., it's very often um, more decentralized solutions which take place uh, at the local level more, where you also have local players in the markets, and there is a bigger need, I guess, to coordinate, consolidate um, data, for instance, so we have um, bigger, bigger challenges in these sectors to have good consolidated data and information. This also means that there is another power, I guess, to lobby for better policy and regulatory frameworks. This is certainly one aspect. Um, and um, this also calls for, I guess, intersectoral collaboration, uh, interministerial collaboration. So let's take the example when you're looking at the local level uh, building, it just means that you have different sectors who need to work together, develop the same languages, it's cross-sectoral approaches which are needed, and this is often more complicated. And um, so I think that this is really contributing a lot to the fact that there is a focus on the power sector. The other part is really that uh, the cost went down so significantly during the last couple of years, so that uh, basically um, there is a cost pressure too on, on the other, on the heating and cooling sectors. Okay, so for purposes of time, we need to swap to the next speaker, which is Werner Weiss. I'll just put his slides through. Okay, thank you very much, Nigel, for your introduction. Um, I'm going to present a study. The intake uh, is out annually for the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program, and the co-authors of this study are Franz Mautner and Monika spörk -Dür. So, basically, what I present are the results of the 2016 edition. Uh, of course, the full study can be downloaded from the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling website. 
there you get significantly more information and data than I can present now. Um, coming or starting uh, with an overview and comparison with other renewable energy technologies, it come, brings me back a little bit to the first question we had, why is the policy mainly focusing on the power sector? Uh, if you have electricity or if you have an energy discussions, usually the energy discussions are mainly electricity discussion. And therefore they simply forget that about 50% of the final energy demand worldwide is heat. And it's also represented here. If you look on the total installed capacity by end of 2015, then we have 435 uh, gigawatt installed capacity on solar thermal. Uh, photovoltaic uh, represents uh, 227 gigawatt installed capacity and solar thermal power, concentrating solar power, it's five gigawatt installed capacity. On the awareness, uh, there it's completely vice versa. So people are just focusing on photovoltaic uh, and believing it's much more installed than solar thermal. Just comparing the figures which were given by Rana before, she mentioned, if I recall it right, 50 gigawatt installed cap new installed capacity in 2015 and solar thermal in 2014, it was 46 gigawatt installed new installed capacity. So it's in the same range, uh, but it's usually underestimated and simply not seen. Focusing on the total installed capacity in the operation, so that's uh, the accumulated installed capacity worldwide by the end of 2014, it's what you see on the screen. You can see that the really dominating market is China, representing 40, uh, sorry, 70% of the total world market, about 11.6% is in Europe, and the rest of the world is less than 18%. Something like 4.4% 4, 4 .4 in, in North America, 2.6% in Asia without China, 2.4% in Latin America, and so forth. So really dominated by China. And we, if we look a little bit back in history, just for uh, to 2012, the changes, then you can see in 2012, it was 67% in China, and it was nearly 16% in Europe. So that means China is really taking more and more of the share of solar thermal installed capacity. If you look to the total installed capacity of unglazed and glazed water collectors in operation, so the 10 leading countries by the end of 2014, then China is leading uh, with an installed capacity of 200 89 collectors and the different markets you, you would have in these different countries. So China is clearly dominated by uh, evacuated tube collectors, even if you can't see it clearly on this slide, because it's on the top of the flat plate collectors and it goes really up to the second floor if you would have one here. Uh, the US market is dominated by unglazed Plastic collectors mainly for swimming pool heating. So these are the blue parts of the, what you can see here in the US and a small part of flat plate collectors. Uh, Germany, mainly flat plate collectors, about 10% are evacuated tube collectors. And then you have in Turkey, again, the same picture like in Germany, Brazil and so forth. So they are mixed uh, flat plate and evacuated tube collectors. But this shows also different applications, especially in the US, where the main market is on pool heating. And it's also a significant share in Brazil and in Australia. If you look to the top 10 related to the per 1,000 inhabitants, so which shows you more on the market penetration, you can see, Rana, I mentioned it already, Austria is leading here ahead of Cyprus, Israel, Barbados, Greece, the Palestinian territories, Australia, and China 
in, in terms of uh, installed capacity per 1,000 inhabitants, it's number eight. So in absolute terms, it's leading. In terms of installed capacity per inhabitant, it's number eight worldwide. What I should mention here maybe at this slide is this leading, these top 10 countries are not leading because they're all coming from a region where there's, there's the sun belt of the world. Most of these countries have a long-term support scheme. Uh, European countries like Austria, we have a subsidy scheme in place for quite a long time. Israel was one of the countries who had already introduced already in 1980 a obligation and so forth. I don't want to go in detail here, but mainly all of these countries are top 10 because they have long-term policy in place. Um, what I might mention here, uh, this year uh, Turkey overtook Germany in the top 10 from number uh, 10 to number 9. Distribution of the total installed capacity uh, by collector type, so as China is leading on the worldwide scale, evacuated tube collectors are more than 70% on the worldwide scale and just 22% of flat plate collectors. If you focus on Europe, you have the opposite picture. Flat plate collectors are dominating with nearly 84% and evacuated tube collectors is about 11% of the market in Europe. So this is really completely different worldwide or if you focus on Europe. The distribution by collector type in different economic regions, uh, if you start on the, on the left-hand side, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, in the US and Canada, the unglazed pool collector is dominating. Uh, if you look on Australia and New Zealand, it's still uh, nearly 60% is pool heating, about 40% are flat plate collectors. Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 53%, it's unglazed water collector, 37% is flat plate collector, 10% ev evacuated tubes. If you look on, on Europe, it's dominated by 85% of flat plate collectors and about 11% of evacuated tubes. On the worldwide scale, of course, due to the dominance of China, again, it's 71% is evacuated tube collectors. Uh, the distribution by type of system. Uh, again, I want maybe I want to start with the worldwide scale. It's 78% of the installed capacity uh, are on uh, thermosiphon systems. So non-pumped systems and pumped systems on the worldwide scale is just 22%. Uh, if you look to North America, if you look to Europe, then you have the, a different picture. In Europe, you have 61% pumped systems and 39% are thermosiphon systems. And I, here I have to mention that in Europe, we, we count here also uh, Turkey, uh, from the geographical point of view to Europe. So therefore, it's nearly 40% of thermal siphon systems are here and 61% are pumped systems. In the US and uh, Canada and North America, it's 97% uh, of the systems are pumped systems. So we have completely different markets uh, in different regions worldwide. Distribution by application. Uh, I don't want to go too much in detail here, but we get more and more uh, different pictures, so different applications. Uh, on the worldwide scale, it's still 63% is domestic hot water systems for single family houses. Then you have this uh, red part with 28%, it's large scale domestic hot water systems, so for multiple family houses, but also for the tourism sector and uh, public sector hotels, hospitals, so medium scale systems. Then you have other, it's this small yellow part, but this is significantly growing, solar district heating and solar process heat, and 6% is on swimming pool heating. And of course, it's different in the different regions worldwide, which you can see here on the slides. Uh, 
the bad news is now, it was mentioned already also by Rana, uh, compared to the year 2013, the new collector installed worldwide decreased by 15%. And this is really, this indicates a trend change. Up to now, we always had growing, growing markets. And in 2014, it was the first time we had a decreased worldwide market. And uh, this is also, this seems to be a trend. Uh, the data we know already from 2015, and uh, this is in the main markets worldwide, uh, this trend seemed to, seems to continue, unfortunately. So this is just showing uh, the market growth from 2000. So we had between 34% was the highest market growth in 2008. Uh, 2013 was 2% and this year, sorry for this, it's minus 15% in 2014. In detail, the market growth uh, compared to 2013, you can see we had growth rates of 8% in Latin America. We had growth rates in Asia without China but we had significantly drops in the market in Australia and especially minus 18% in China. This was a major drop taking into account that they are dominating the world market, which results in a worldwide decrease of minus 15%. Focusing now on just the installed capacity in 2014, so it's a the capacity which was installed in this year. Again, in total terms, China was leading with uh, 36 gigawatt installed capacity, followed by Turkey, Brazil, India, the US, and so forth. So again, a, a dominance of, of China. And uh, mentioned already, uh, here there was a, a change in Germany fell back and if newcomers in the top 10, it's Mexico and Greece in 2014. And if I compare it to the year 2010, just looking just for four years back, then we have already a significant change. That means in 2010, we had four European countries under the top 10. And if we look to 2014, there's just Germany left and the top 10 uh, from Europe. So that's a clear trend uh, going to new markets who are dominating the world market. It's not anymore major, the industrialized countries. So other countries are coming in and investing heavily in, in this technology. Again, installed 2014 per 1000 inhabitants gives you a different picture, of course, again, then you have uh, Israel is not, still number one. China is in second place, followed by the Palestinian territories. Denmark, so it's with the large scale systems, district heating, they are no, now number four. Uh, followed by Australia, Greece, Turkey, Austria, Cyprus. And new and under the top, top 10 is Switzerland in terms of installed capacity by 1,000 units. We have a very positive development in large-scale district heating and cooling applications in Europe, uh, but also in other parts of the world. But this slide basically shows the development in Europe on large-scale systems. In total, uh, on large-scale district heating systems, we have installed about 1.1 million square meters. and there's a very positive trend, as I mentioned already. It's tw about 20 new systems uh, are installed per year. If you look where they are installed, they're mainly installed in Denmark. In Denmark, they have nearly, so it's 79 uh, systems installed with a total capacity of 577 megawatt. This, and if you compare it to Germany, Austria, or Sweden, so number two, three, and four. You can see uh, that the average size of the system in Denmark, Denmark is significantly higher. In Denmark, the average size per system is about seven megawatt, 
which relates to about 10,000 square meter per system. And in Germany, Austria, and Sweden, the average size of this district heating, solar assisted district heating systems is in the range of one megawatt or 1,500 square meters. So there's a significant difference between Denmark and the rest of Europe, if you want. Uh, just to give you one picture of one of the biggest systems at the moment, it's Voyens district heating plant in Denmark. In the meantime, it's even bigger. Now it's about 70,000 square meters. And on the, in the middle of the picture, on the left-hand side, you see the huge seasonal storage, this 203,000 cubic meter of seasonal heat storage. Uh, there is a big discussion in Austria at the moment to install in the next three years a very big system with about 450,000 square meters and a 1.8 million cubic meter pit heat storage. So this is under discussion, but it looks quite optimistic. I'm quite optimistic that this system will be built in the next years. So we have a very positive trend here in large scale district heating systems. Looking on solar cooling systems, uh, here we lost a little bit the dynamic. It's still going up, but still on low scale. The total installed number of systems is in the range of 1,200 worldwide, and about 900 of these systems are installed uh, in Europe. The global process heat application, so it's also a growing market, large scale markets. Uh, the total installed capacity uh, we have documented, I have to mention, so these are the results of the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Task uh, 49. There is a SHIP data bank, worldwide database on solar heat for industrial process application. This is what is shown here. So in total, it's about uh, up to two, uh, about 200,000 square meters installed, so significantly smaller than in district heating. And if we start on the left-hand side, you see the large-scale systems bigger than 0.7 megawatt or bigger than 1,000 square meters. Then we have 21 systems installed within total 75 megawatt or about 110,000 square meters. Then you have systems in the range between 500 and 1,000 square meters. We have uh, 35 systems installed with a total capacity of 16 megawatt and small scale industrial process heat applications between 100 and 500 square meters. It's the, the biggest number with 86 systems representing 14 megawatt and again in the range of 20,000 square meters. Uh, most of these systems are installed in the food and beverage industry. So a lot was done, for instance, in the, in the beer brewing, in the brewing industry, uh, but also in the galvanic industry. And the picture you see here is the biggest system at the moment in industrial process heat. It's a copper mine in Chile. The total installed capacity of 39,000 square meters representing 26 megawatt in the Atacama Desert. And the heat is used here for process heat, so for, for the copper weaning process of the copper mine. Very quickly, the number of jobs. So in total worldwide, we have something like 730,000 jobs worldwide in solar thermal. The turnover worldwide uh, is estimated at uh, about 21 billion euro or 24 billion US dollar, so it's really a significant turnover uh, done by solar thermal for the solar thermal industry. Uh, finally, what we published first time in our study are uh, solar thermal system cost and levelized cost of heat or solar generated heat, because this was always a big discussion. Uh, what I present now, uh, we focused on four types of systems. On the one hand, of the levelized cost of thermal siphon systems, pumped systems for small scale systems, so for domestic hot water systems for single family houses, then pumped systems for multiple family houses, so for large systems, and finally combi systems 
uh, for hot water and space heating. These are the next uh, four slides. What you can see here on the slide, on the bottom you see the different system or several systems we compared from Australia, Brazil, China, India, Israel, South Africa and Turkey. And on the left Y axis you see the specific system cost in euro per square meter of gross collector area. So this includes the total system cost including installation. Uh, this is shown here on the left Y axis and on the right Y axis you see the levelized cost of heat in euro cent per kilowatt hour. What you can see here, these diamonds, they show you the levelized cost of heat. Uh, for thermal siphon systems, for domestic hot water systems, we are in, in Turkey, they have the lowest levelized cost. So for a four square meter system with a 170 liter storage tank, and even if a, with a service lifetime of 10 years, they reach levelized cost of heat in the range of three euro cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, if you go to South Africa, a similar system, so the, the levelized cost of heat are significantly higher in the range of more than eight euro cent per kilowatt hour. This is of course due to the fact that the system cost uh, is significantly higher in South Africa compared to, to Turkey. If you go to Australia, they have significantly higher cost, system cost, but higher system lifetimes for thermosiphon systems. So what we took into considera consideration here is also the, the knowledge we have of the average system lifetime. And this is of course, has a, plays a significant really significant role in the end of uh, levelized cost of heat. Jumping now to the specific uh, investment cost and levelized cost of solar heat for small pump systems. So these systems are in the range of four square, four to six square meter uh, collector area in combination with a 200 to 300 liter storage tank. And again, we compared here a range of different systems systems per country. And the cost of levelized, uh, the, the specific cost per euro per square meter and the range between 250 euro per square meter and can go up uh, like in China here to 600. And in the worst case, we are in like in, in France, we are in, in the range of nearly 1,400 uh, euro per square meter. Concerning levelized cost of heat, you can see this uh, system in China, we have something like eight euro cent per kilowatt hour. And we can reach the same with the Australian system. It's, uh, it's also in the range of eight euro cent per kilowatt hour. And the most expensive uh, systems in France with the average specific cost of the system of 1,400 euro per square meter ends up, of course, uh, at nearly 20 euro cent per kilowatt hour. But nevertheless, even the French system, it's uh, still in the range of electricity cost. If you would prepare hot water with electricity, it's in the same range uh, like the electricity. All other countries are significantly below and can compete with gas and of course with electricity in, in all cases. Uh, for large pump systems uh, with more or less the same situation, uh, depending on the climatic conditions of course, the cost of the system, the lifetime of the system, we are in the, in the range between three euro cent per kilowatt hour and in France, uh, we're in the range of uh, 14 euro cent per kilowatt hour. So this shows you, again, it brings me back to the question of before, why is the policy focusing mainly on electricity? Because it's significantly simpler to work with levelized cost of electricity, because this is mainly usually the same range worldwide. 
whereas heat is very especially heat of uh, coming from uh, is used for uh, uh, coming from solar thermal is significantly depending on the application. But nevertheless, in in summary, in, in the sun belt of the world, so we have high solar solar radiation. Uh, we are in the range between three and eight euro cent per kilowatt hour, and uh, in central and northern Europe, we are in the range between eight and let's say fifteen uh, euro cent per, per kilowatt hour. Yeah, and the combi systems, it's obviously, it's also in this range, depending on the country. Uh, the cheapest systems are here in, in Brazil. And with this, I want to thank you for ad your attention. If you want to know a little bit more about this study, just download it from the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling website. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Werner. Excellent uh, presentation. I have a couple of um, questions for clarification. Um, one is from Jonathan K. What variables are included in levelized cost of heat? Uh, the variables are, on the one hand, it's uh, so we have a definition. So the you can see if I just go back one slide. So. Uh, it, yeah, you have on the one hand we have this. Uh, the system is defined, so we have uh, reference systems. Uh, we have the, the service lifetime is a variable. It's the climatic condition, uh, and it's the cost. And of course, uh, it's uh, the financing cost, so the uh, interest rate. But you find all the variables in detail in the in the study where it's they find all the variables for each of the countries okay great um and the other one was um did your presentation include the project in glass point in oman no it's not it's not including uh concentrating systems the glass point system is uh, a biopolic draft collector so we Thinking about to include the heat applications uh, from concentrating uh, systems, so for an evacuate uh, power product trough or linear Fresnel in the next edition next year, uh, but this is not included in up to now. Okay, great. Um, there's just one clarification point here. We you're using the indicator per 1,000 inhabitants. Um, what is that actually telling uh, the audience? Because certain countries will have quite a heavy heat load and others maybe not. Yeah, but in, in general, it, if you show the installed capacity per 1,000 inhabitant, this shows, gives you an indicator on the market penetration. So what is installed per capita? Uh, this is the main reason why we show it, because otherwise, and maybe it's also the background, I'm coming from Austria, we are representing 8 million, and if you compare it to China with 1.4 billion people, of course, they always install more, even if they have a significantly lower market penetration. Uh, and of course, it's not uh, focusing on, on the different uh, uh, heat loads, but if you keep in mind that most of the installations of solar heat are at the moment for hot water preparation, this makes not a significant di significant difference between uh, hot water demand in a hot climate or a cold climate. So it's not a significant di difference. But it's mainly showing the, the market penetration when we show it per capita. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Uh, it's now time to move on to our next speaker. So I will change the slides. And that is Barbel Epp from the solarthermal.org. need to unmute Barbel. Yep. 
Excellent, Barbara. Please uh, continue. Yes good, yes. good afternoon, everybody. I go back to my starting point. Excellent. Good afternoon. Thank you, Nigel, for the nice introduction. My topic today is solar heating and cooling trends in policy and industry. One of the key issues of the GSR 2015 is uh, describing the market development uh, most currently, um, that means uh, year 2015, on global and national level. Generally speaking, the markets were under pressure in 2015. And this is the key chart showing the market development 2015 in newly added capacities. In total, these 18 countries declined by 14%, which is the same trend like Rana already explained for 2014. I want to give some reasons. China is uh, down by 17% again, so it's a big collapse. And this is due to um, the overheated construction market. The real estate market dropped in China from double-digit annual growth rates at the beginning of 2014 to a stagnation in December 2015. So a steep decline. The second reason is that the focus of the government uh, towards renewable electricity sort of puts is there's not much room for solar heating support measures at the moment. European markets also in general down down. They are hit by the low oil and gas prices. Um, additional challenges were seen in Spain, Italy, France um, because of bureaucratic processes associated with the national subsidy schemes. We have um, generally low construction activities in several countries and an increasing competition from other renewable heating technologies in the residential sector mainly. Brazil also not performing too well in 2015, whereas it was a booming market before, which is due to the national economic crisis in the country, and um, also the delay in uh, the social housing program, which was a big driver in the past because of a lot of apartments are um, equipped with solar water heaters. India's industry stagnated in 2015 also after several years of growth, which is uh, still a consolidation phase after the government stopped uh, the incentives in August 2014. Sorry. Government and industry are currently discussing new support strategies. And there is one interesting instrument to be discussed, which is uh, renewable heat obligation because they have a very renewable purchase obligation in the electricity sector. So there is a draft of a law at the ministry and is discussed currently. Despite these overall negative trends in some countries, there were extremely well-performing countries. We heard of Denmark 55% up again in uh, 2015 due to the high demand of large-scale solar district heating. Israel climbed up again 9%, which was actually caused by a strong hailstorm in 2015. Israel is a strong replacement market, and the hailstorm ruined so many glasses that there was a large replacement extra load in 2015. Turkey also up by 10%. Uh, the industry profits by its strong supply chain, 800 sales points, and around 3,000 specialized installers do a good job in promoting solar. Well, we heard from Rana that adoption of solar heating and cooling policies is much slower than in electricity field. You have seen this chart. 21 countries worldwide have solar obligations in place. None was uh, followed up in, uh, none, none was ended, added in 2015. So this is bad news. This uh, table shows you roughly um, the number of countries which have policy in place for solar heating and cooling, middle column, and renewable electricity, the right column. And you see the big difference that countries, much fewer numbers of countries have policies in place. Um, and this is in all categories, whether it's support policy as well as targets. And this new ENDC um, 
targets which was all submitted during Paris time. We could only identify three countries which have explicit solar heating and cooling targets in these uh, submitted papers. I would like to mention that these 45 countries are, with all their precise solar heating and cooling targets, are mentioned in a big table in the solar um, status report on page 181. Also, Rana already talked about the big role of municipalities, which is also um, profiting solar heating and cooling. She was mentioning the 100% uh, campaign, which is uh, followed by more and more countries, uh, uh, cities worldwide. I would like to mention um, Amsterdam, which had a far-reaching new objective in 2015. Uh, or they committed themselves to decarbonize its district heating system and set an immediate goal for increasing connections to a total of 230,000 homes within the city by 2040. Graz was already mentioned by Werner, a huge system of 350 megawatt solar district heating where the local utility wants to sign a contract with an energy service company soon. One very important trend we mentioned in the Global Status Report this year is the transition from single-family houses to commercial sector. This is evidence from the, from, uh, the uh, market figures that uh, Werner Weiss gathers every year. You see here the column on the left shows you the share of applications worldwide within the total installed water capacity, and on the right-hand side, within the newly installed added capacity 2014. And you see that the residential sector, which was dominating so far with 64%, is reducing a lot if it comes to added power. And we have a very big shift towards multifamily houses, tourism, and public sector. Uh, some examples, China is uh, probably the strongest country moving into this direction. Um, if you believe the statistics we receive from Sun Vision, they have already 61% of the newly added collector area in 2015 in this commercial segment, multifamily houses, tourism, and public. This corresponds with 2 to 6 million, 26 million square meters. Poland is also a country where this shift is fairly evident. They have strong drivers in large projects in public buildings, hospitals, um, financed by international funds, and their residential sector is declining a lot because the national subsidy scheme is favoring a lot solar PV at the moment. Linked to this uh, trend towards commercial is this trend, which says turnkey system suppliers develop new business models. Why is that? Commercial clients, obviously, are challenging. They do, don't, they do not want to invest money in activities that are not their core business. And they are not very keen in taking over high financial risk or even operating and maintenance responsibility. So what happened? Uh, solar heating and cooling companies more and more become or offering energy performance contracting. So they become energy providers, and they mean they finance, install, operate, and maintain solar heating and cooling systems. We have reached, uh, researched a lot in this domain on uh, solarthermalworld.org, and this table results of many stories that we did. These are all companies which offer solar uh, solar contracts already, solar heat contracts already. You see they are not really covering only Europe, but they are worldwide. You have them in Chile, in Austria, USA, India, Spain, France. So it's fairly mixed. And it's a growing number of companies, actually. The links in this chart are linked to publications on Solar Thermal World. We have also a number of startups which we're not really able to quantify yet in terms of installations, but which all announced to also get into this direction of ESCO. They are again in very different countries. We have even companies in Armenia and again United States. I think we have sort of a trend towards closing this gap in offering professional turnkey financed uh, systems to the industry, to commercial clients. But what is the big gap now is the, the financing that means, um, well, having funds 
bankers, investment funds, which are specialized um, about this technology, which are open to finance it, to guarantee solar yields, and to facilitate this new emerging industry. This is really a big gap we are seeing there, and it needs big efforts to close that. There is a new era of investment in solar process heat. Um, generally, solar process heat is, for the moment, only a fraction of the residential sector, whereas the long-term potential is seen as large as residential. So these are figures from the technology roadmap stressing that 8.9 exajoule could be covered by solar by 2050 in the residential sector and 7.2 in the industrial segment. So they are almost equal, but process heat is very much behind. So we have this 180 um, process heat identified projects within the database ship minus plants.info. And the reasons are manifold. You have the cheap oil and gas prices. You have still high system costs, often absent, absence of guidelines, lack of business models, and lack of knowledge among potential customers. But even so, you have a, an amazing situation that in some niche markets, as Werner already said, there is a high demand because solar can compete against gas and oil prices in these segments. This is mostly applications far away from gas grids where fossils have to be transported to. And um, somebody already asked for this class point project. It's this one. It's a gigawatt investment, um, which is a pure commercial project without subsidy by the Petroleum Development Oman. They ordered a 600 million um, US dollar investment, which will become a one gigawatt steam producing plant in 2017. And the technology is seen here. It's parabolic um, collectors, parabolic draft collectors, light ones from aluminum. And they are put in glass houses to defend them against ascent and um, storms. And this will cover this one gigawatt, which will be the biggest ever you know, done on steam and even CSP, which is a, a British company called Glasspoint to do the um, installation. There is one um, other trend which is one was aimed at uh, Werner. Um, Werner, I'll just unmute. Um, are there key sectors for the industrial process heating identified in your study? And if so, which ones and why? The, the key sectors are food and beverage industry. Uh, because uh, usually, of course, industry is looking on, on very short payback times. And you have to look on industries which are most probably not moving uh, in, in the short time. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of uh, breweries, for instance, installed solar thermal systems because they stay where they are. Uh, they will, people will drink beer in the region in the next hundred years. Uh, if you go, there's another big potential uh, in the textile industry. But the textile industry is much more risky, so you never know if uh, textile industry from Europe, for instance, disappears within the next two years to Asia. So the main focus where we see the biggest potential is in the food and beverage industry, but also, as you could see, uh, in, in the mining sector, where they need a, a lot of low temperature heat, like in the a copper mining industry, where the temperature range they need is in the, is, uh, in the range between 50 and 60 degrees centigrade which is excellent, of course, for solar thermal applications. On the other hand, we have now just started a, a new project. It's a cooperation between Germany and Austria with the car manufacturing industry. There's also a big potential scene, uh, also in the galvanic industry. So everywhere where you have low temperature heat demand, so that means up to 100 degrees. But if you go to concentrating systems, up to 250 degrees. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we had a quick question from Nicholas on uh, Tirana. Um, 
the 12 percent increase China okay um, we've come to the end of our allotted time and um, we experienced some technical difficulties for which I apologize profusely um, and so I will take the opportunity to close the webinar um, thank you for attending today's uh, webinar seminar uh, we will within 48 hours um, have this presentation available on our website solarthermalworld.org and on behalf of the guest speakers uh, Rana, Babel, Werner and myself I would like to thank you for attending I am Nigel Cotton I hope this has been helpful thank you for your time and have a great day thank you very much